Okay, well, good evening, everyone. I'm uh, Clemence Kuchera. I'm the Assistant Dean for the Graduate Law Programs. Um, and with me this evening is uh, Professor Chris McKelly. So before we go with the interview, I just like, let's just go quickly over the agenda. So we'll do uh, a little bit. I have a few questions for Professor McKelly, and then we'll talk about a little bit more in details what uh, the MSL and Government Law and Policy Program is and what courses we offer. We're also going to talk about what makes McGeorge online graduate degrees uh, distinctive. Um, and then finally, we'll open it up for Q&A. Professor Michele has uh, agreed to stay on, so he'll be happy to answer any of your questions at that time. So first, Professor Michele, thank you very much for being with us this evening. Happy to do so. So you're an adjunct professor at McGeorge. You teach in the MSL program as well as in the JD program. And obviously you're principal at uh, a Sacramento government relation firm that is Apri and Michele. Um, I put in the link uh, on, the, on the PowerPoint of your, uh, of your website for your lobbying firm, but I also put in the CAP um, Impact blog that you, uh, that you publish um, on, because I think that many of the students or many of the prospective students who are here today would probably find it quite interesting. So, well, and in fact, in uh, <clears throat> both the MSL uh, legislatures and lawmaking course, as well as the lobbying and politics course, uh, both use as part of the curriculum for those two courses, a number of the podcasts that are published on the website at Cap Impact California. Great. Yeah. So you talk about obviously about the course that, that you're teaching and we'll get to it in a minute, but if we can take perhaps a little bit like more of a macro level and can you tell us a little bit about your job? What is a, what does a lobbyist do? Sure, well, there are a number of different types of lobbyists. I am one type, which is what we call a contract lobbyist. Uh, we also talk about uh, trade association lobbyists. Now those can be, nonprofit or for-profit associations. They can be from business to labor, environmental. Uh, I always jokingly say that uh, every interest uh, group out there has its own association, even the lobbyists. We have a group called the Institute of Governmental Advocates, IGA, here in Sacramento that is the trade association for lobbyists. Uh, the third type is what we call the in-house lobbyist, and that's somebody who, for example, is employed in-house by generally a, a corporation or a business. <clears throat> now, those are the three types on the private sector side. Again, the type that I am is a contract lobbyist, and as it uh, as the name would indicate, uh, clients called lobbyist employers in the state. Uh, contract with a lobbyist to represent them. There's also a fourth type, and believe it or not, these are you know government lobbyists. And what I mean by that is we have about 200 agencies, departments, boards, and commissions in the state of California, all under the executive branch. And all of those different types of executive branch entities actually have a lobbyist. Now, they have different names. For example, at the agency level, they may be called the Deputy Secretary for Legislation. At the department level, Deputy Director for Legislative Affairs or Legislation. And these individuals represent the governor's administration before the legislature. So whether it's you know, the Department of Motor Vehicles or Caltrans or uh, the Environmental Protection Agency, all those different executive branch agencies have lobbyists themselves on behalf of the administration. So those are the four types of lobbyists. You ask, you know, what I do, what my colleagues do. Essentially, we represent our clients. Now, again, somebody who is in-house or with a trade association they have that one individual client, as does the public sector lobbyist. And by the way, there are also local government lobbyists. For example, what for the past 17 years or so, I've represented 
uh, the third largest and the and the largest in the state transit agency. That's Los Angeles County Metropolitan Transportation Authority, LA Metro. And my client, the deputy executive officer, and he has two individuals that work for him. They're also lobbyists, but they're employed by a local transit agency. You know, <clears throat> even some of the local governments, counties, cities, special districts have lobbyists as well. And all of us represent our clients before most of us do exclusively, most of my colleagues, the legislative branch, meaning we lo lobby the legislature, the assembly and the Senate. Uh, a handful of us also do regulatory agency lobbying. So we lobby these state agencies in their quasi legislative or when they develop and adopt rules or regulations, we lobby those agencies and those departments on their rulemaking activities as well. So again, what a lobbyist generally does is represent his or her clients. We advocate, we educate, um, you know, legislators, appointed officials in those state agencies, and of course their staff uh, who are invaluable in advising legislators and the committees about our clients and what they do and their issues and their perspectives on legislation and or regulations. Thank you. Um, and so why is having a legal background so important for lobbyists? Obviously you mentioned there are a lot of different types of lobbyists and I'm assuming many of them don't have necessarily a legal background. So perhaps if I could rephrase a little bit my question is, how is having a legal background helping uh, someone who wants to enter or who, are, who works uh, as a lobbyist? Well, I guess there are two things, you know, first, whether it's the legislative process with our legislative branch of government, you know, assembly members and senators, and of course the governor plays a critical role because he signs or vetoes those bills, but understanding laws, understanding how they're written, how they're developed and how they're implemented, interpreted and even enforced, as well as the other set of laws, the regulations, um, is very valuable for a lobbyist to have that understanding. The other piece of it is the skills that you develop whether it's your research or analytical skills, certainly your oral and written advocacy skills that you can develop um, in either law school or in McGeorge's MSL program is invaluable as a lobbyist because that is what you're doing on a day-to-day -day basis. You know, behind the scenes, you're reading, you're analyzing, you're developing fact sheets, you're interpreting what are perhaps deficiencies in the laws or changes that need to be made. You might help draft that legislation or regulatory changes. And then that's sort of, you know, behind the scenes and then out in front is the advocacy, whether you're writing a fact sheet, an advocacy letter, testifying before a legislative committee or a regulatory agency, you know, those skills are things that you could develop in this program and so having those skills and that knowledge is invaluable to being a successful lobbyist. So, so my next was, question was, was gonna be about like someone who doesn't necessarily wants to be a lobbyist, but who wants to expand a little bit, just let's say a legislative career, you know, at large, there's so many things that one can do. Is your answer the same about how valuable having a, a legal background is? Or are there specific yes, because, positions? Oh, sorry. Sorry to no, no, interrupt you, Dean. <laughs> no, no, go ahead. Go ahead. Well, what I, yes, I mean, the answer is yes, whether you're advocating from the outside or, you know, whether you're committee staff, meaning you staff legislative committees, you know, perhaps you work at a rulemaking agency, whether it's on the, you know, legal side, the legislative side. Uh, if you work, uh, you know, for an individual legislator, an elected official, or perhaps an appointed official in a state agency, again, the MSL program or the JD program are, are invaluable for many of the same reasons that they're invaluable to being a successful lobbyist. You know, again, 
whether you're working in the legislative branch or in the executive branch, you are working on developing, analyzing, interpreting statutes on the on the legislative side, regulations on the executive branch side, and you're advocating in many instances, you're advocating your, you know, your legislator bosses, uh, specific bills, their legislative package, uh, or perhaps your agency's interpretation of a statute or its implementation of a regulation. So the same skills that you are utilizing as a lobbyist, you're going to utilize also as in a legislative or executive branch career as well, I think. Um, do you know on the top of your head how many uh, people work uh, for the legislature, uh, broadly yeah. defined, you know? Yeah, many? broadly, there's about 2,500 or so between the two houses, um, as well as the committees in both the Assembly and the Senate. And then, of course, you have several thousand gubernatorial appointees. Now, that doesn't include the obviously tens of thousands of career civil service people who work in you know different state agencies and departments, boards, commissions, bureaus, et cetera. But I'm talking about those gubernatorial appointees at the higher levels. You know, that's that's about 4,000 gubernatorial appointees throughout state government. And then there's probably another you know, 1,200 or so registered lobbyists. And of course, those registered lobbyists have support staff um, and others who work for them. So there are several thousand people in the lobby corps in broad terms. Wow. And I'm assuming this model- of that's no just, probably by the way, scale. Dean, sorry to interrupt, but that's just in Sacramento. You know, obviously we have, over, not obviously, we have lobbyists and those who support lobbyists at the federal level. There's, you know, some uh, 12 to 15,000 uh, congressional staffers. There's somewhere in the neighborhood of about 10,000 registered lobbyists in DC. And then of course you have all the folks at the local level, whether it's here in Sacramento, at the city council level or board of supervisors, certainly all the major cities from you know, San Francisco, San Jose, Bakersfield, Fresno, down into Los Angeles, Orange County, San Diego, et cetera. You've got lobbyists operating at the local level. And so naturally there's, thousands of either lobbying jobs on the outside or there are governmental type positions that would benefit from you know an msl degree as well thank you and i was actually going to comment a little bit on that but i was going to say also that this is true very much for california and at different scales depending on the states it's you know this right the msl degree and the the skills that you teach in your course like is applicable regardless of the states you live in Exactly. Yep. And so can we talk a little bit about the skills that you teach in your course? Because you teach two courses, so the executive branch and you also teach lobbying. Yeah, well, <laughs> what we um, so one of the required MSL uh, uh, sorry courses in a student's first year in the McGeorge program is legislatures and lawmaking. And so what we um, do there is, is that we go through, that's the third one amongst the uh, required courses of the eight. We start off with a review of the federal branches, of course, legislative and executive. Then we go to the state levels, legislative and executive. We spend some time on even statutory uh, construction, uh, and we have uh, students even draft a short bill. Uh, every week you have quizzes on the readings, you have lectures, you have podcasts. Um, we use a statutory interpretation uh, casebook, just like you would do in law school, because it not only teaches the students about the lawmaking process, but also has valuable insights from 
you know, developing at the congressional level, for example, a major statute like the Civil Rights Act. And then we get into how those statutes are interpreted by not only the courts, which we're all familiar with, but also those rulemaking agencies, particularly at the federal level. And again, then we transfer over to the state level. And so you're getting the same sorts of, you know, statutory interpretation uh, skills. You are having to submit a written assignment each week, which requires a student to draw from their readings and analyze an issue and advocate for one position or the other or one side of the argument. And then, as I said, in our concluding weeks of the legislatures and lawmaking course, students are drafting a bill themselves. And that's a, you know, a real tremendous opportunity to really put everything together. And you'll quickly realize first how difficult it is to actually draft legislation, but also to see how language is susceptible to different interpretations. One of the electives, we have a, a, a wonderful uh, set of them, uh, everything from negotiations, uh, certainly some very specialized area like political and election law and water law, uh, but one of them is the lobbying and politics. And, you know, we spend a lot of time understanding all the aspects of a lobbying career. We utilize a um, textbook that I and 40 other lobbyists here in Sacramento put together and wrote different chapters. While there are a number of textbooks uh, at the federal level, or if you will, lobbying at the congressional level, there hasn't been anything at the state level, in particular in California. And so 40, as I said, 40 or so lobbyists wrote about 45 chapters of this book, everything from introductory things about, you know, what a lobbyist is and what they do to starting a lobbying business, uh, all of the re public reporting requirements, just at the federal level, a lobbyist and his or her clients and what they work on and what they paid are all a matter of public record. We talk about the different types of lobbying, certainly the main ones, legislative and regulatory, but then some specialized things from the state budget to we have specialized lobbying at the Public Utilities Commission, at the California Transportation Commission, the California Coastal Commission. These are areas, these are executive branch agencies uh, where lobbyists specialize in that area. And so we have a handful of lobbyists who just work at the PUC or the CTC and the Coastal Commission. And so students learn about that and go through exercises about, you know, being a lobbyist and understanding the laws. There are many ethical rules for operating at the local, state, and federal levels as a lobbyist. And those are all the types of things that we walk through. Now, of course, you're not going to be an expert at the end, just like you're not an expert bill drafter, if you will, after, you know, the legislatures and lawmaking course. But certainly the lobbying and politics course will give MSL students a very clear idea of what you do as a lobbyist, how you do it, the laws and the rules regulating them, some of the, again, specialized forms of lobbying, and you'll clearly be exposed. There's really nothing else like um, the lobbying and politics course because, you know, in other law schools, there's just a handful that do it. You know, they talk conceptually and they talk about like different influences on an elected official. In other words, what are some of the factors that go into a legislator's decision making and stuff like that? Sort of looking at, you know, lobbyists and lobbying from more of an academic place. This is a very practical teaching you, you know, practical skills. And again, the aspects of what do you do every day? How do you write an effective advocacy letter? How do you prepare and give effective committee testimony in a legislative committee or testimony before a rulemaking agency in the state? So again, you'll come out of it with 
understanding some more of the practical aspects, not just looking at lobbying from an academic viewpoint. Thank you. I, I think uh, what is key also, um, and that what, what we have uh, duplicated in other courses is the professor who teaches uh, the course is someone who practices in this field. So, right, that's, I think, crucial, as you mentioned, is not just the theoretical approach that we that you're teaching, is you're teaching the skill, the how to, which I think that this MSL degree, because like obviously we are targeting people who are already graduated with an undergraduate degree and who either are starting their career or who are gonna, who wants to get into this field, like they need to know the skills to die and they need to be able to directly implement and apply the knowledge that they've learned in their class in their day-to-day -day work, which I think we've seen this over and over from uh, former students. Um, yeah. So thank you very much, uh, Professor Michele. Sure. I think because of time, I'm gonna move on to the next slide. And if you don't mind staying just for a couple more minutes and then I'll open it up for Q&A. So for our, our uh, attendees, I will uh, take questions via the chat or via the Q&A box. So as I'm going through the next few slides, uh, feel free to go ahead and start submitting your, your questions. Um, so our program is a 26 unit uh, degree. Uh, as you see, we have eight required courses. We have a number of electives. Uh, for those of you who though would like to do a little bit more research on a particular topic, um, we have the option, uh, uh, our students have the option to sign up for a directed research. Uh, so it's like an independent studies uh, or capstone course or master's uh, thesis where you work one-on-one -on -one with, with a faculty on a very particular topic, a particular area, yeah, something that is just like uh, important to you. Um, some students do the MSL program and intend to not do any other graduate degrees, but if you at some point are thinking about perhaps doing a PhD uh, program, you probably would want to do uh, take a course that requires capstone, so you can have uh, some type of, um, of um, uh, paper that uh, is of publishable quality. Um, so our program is uh, taught fully online in an asynchronous manner. So we still have um, our professors still assign weekly readings, weekly deadline, weekly discussion uh, boards, uh, weekly quizzes, as Professor Michele mention, but you're not required to log in at a specific and a, a particular time. You can do this at your convenience over the week. Um, we have so interactive weekly discussion where not it's not just interactive between the professor and the students, but also amongst the students. We have quizzes. Uh, we also have a chat uh, that it's not just like a free for all like chat. It's a little bit more structured, but again, it's to try to create uh, this uh, warm and collegial environment um, in an online setting, which I have to say our students have uh, often commented uh, on that. Uh, as Professor also Michele mentioned, like in each of our courses, we teach practical real world assignments. Um, and you of course get regular feedback from professors, which is key in an online environment. We also cap our, our courses to 20 students. Uh, again, because we wanna encourage that um, uh, that exchange among students and professors. And once you start having like a, a larger group, it's a little harder to create that environment. So next steps for those of you who are interested is uh, to go online to start an application. Uh, for those of you who are attending the, the webinar today, we will send you uh, uh, an application fee waiver. Uh, the priority application deadline is June 6th. We still accept application after that, but if you apply prior to June 6th, you're guaranteed that within two weeks, you will receive an admission and a scholarship offer. Um, and um, uh, classes starts uh, August 15th. Actually, I should rephrase a little bit what I said. If you apply by June 6th, you know we will get back to you with our admissions decision and a scholarship offer uh, within two weeks. And so class starts, it starts uh, August 15. And even though it's asynchronous, we are on the semester basis. So we go from August to uh, end of November and our courses are taught over 15 weeks. So if you have any questions, here is uh, you know, the best way to contact me or you can directly email our, uh, our office, uh, graduatelaw.pacific.edu or call us, but I think 
I think what we are all waiting for is a Q&A session. So I'm gonna stop sharing my screen right now so I can see uh, the chat and the Q&A. So don't be shy. So again, thank you very much, Professor Mikhail, for being here. I know sure. this is a very busy time with the budget being negotiated. All, always <laughs> happy to talk about McGeorge's programs and the MSL program in particular. Thank you. I'm going to try to be a little bit more, uh, give our, our guest uh, a little bit more time, but please really don't hesitate to ask questions either about the course, about the application process. So while we're waiting, so the MSL degree is, um, is a program that started at McGeorge, at McGeorge roughly 10 years ago. We used to have this government law and policy concentration, but we used to teach it here in person. Um, and over uh, the last few years, we've got a lot of feedback saying like, for those of us who are working or who are interning in this field, like the, it's extremely hard for us to tell, to say it to our boss, like I have to make it to a 6.15 PM class because we have a very strong uh, GD evening program. So pre-pandemic, we, we uh, developed the program to be moved online. Uh, so it was designed to be online on purpose and not as a result of uh, the pandemic. Well, there's still a lot of interaction between both students and professors. I mean, every week we have required postings, not just that uh, between the professors and the students, but also the students themselves, just like you would have that sort of interaction in a classroom setting, you instead have it in an online setting. And that's part of the you know, grade that we have and that we give to students is that participation. Thank you. And so students take two classes at a time, perhaps I should have mentioned that. So, and I, uh, by mistake, I meant, uh, mentioned that you um, teach uh, the executive branch class, but obviously you don't, it's the, legislature and lawmaking class, but students take two classes at a time. So the first semester is introduction to legal analysis with uh, contracts to learn the foundational and the basic skills of legal writing and legal analysis. And then they move on to legislature and lawmaking as well as with the executive branch. Um, so we have a question. Do we learn about municipal election law, ballot me measures and recalls? You well, um, I don't teach the election law course, but yes, the uh, McGeorge is very fortunate to have um, gotten a long time uh, attorney here in Sacramento who practices and has practiced uh, quite some time in the political and election law area. And she teaches about state, local and federal election campaign law. So. Yes, you will have exposure to both local and state and federal. Yes, and you, this is one of our elective course. And so this is a course that you could take in your second year. Exactly. And for those who of you who are in Sacramento, you may have uh, heard about her as uh, Rebecca Olson, who entire practice is election law. So the MSL program in government law and policy uh, builds upon like the fantastic foundation, uh, the fantastic uh, capital center in uh, law and policy that Professor Michele is uh, involved with. Uh, the capital center is uh, a research center for the law school um, and it offers also uh, a program for the JD students. And uh, it's because of all of their hard work, so all of your hard work in the Capital Center that we were able to develop and this MSL program. And just very much just to create courses 
for those of you who want to know about the law, but who do not want to practice as an attorney. So who really needs to specialize in very particular area, but yet know having where you need to have that legal foundation in order to be successful in your career. Yeah, and as you know, Dean, we've had we have several graduates uh, from the MSL program in the government law and policy concentration who work in the third house as lobbyists, but they also work in the Capitol building itself. And so I know that a lot of those folks are happy to talk about their McGeorge experience, their MSL degree, and how it's helped them in their career. Yes, we have a current member enrolled in the program. Uh, a story will come out soon, but so um, so we're very happy about that. So seeing no other questions, I don't uh, want to have everybody just wait uh, around. So I want to thank you, Professor Michele, for uh, joining us this evening. Thank you to our attendees. Uh, we will, my colleague, Brendan Webb, who's here, um, uh, on the Zoom, we'll send an email to all of you who have attended with um, a coupon code um, for the application fee waiver. If you have any questions, just email us. Um, and if you have any questions for Professor Michele, just you can simply email me and I'll pass along your questions and put you directly in touch with Professor Michele. So thank you very much all. Thank you. And have a wonderful evening. Good evening. Thank you.